Chris, how you doing, buddy? Welcome back, man. What's going on, guys? We're good. good. How you hope, doing? Hope you're staying safe. Doing what I can. Doing yeah. what I can. Yeah, aren't, aren't we all? You know, tell us about the viability of the NBA players all buying in and going back to play the, the game. Because we're starting to hear some guys worry about, you know, if it's safe, we'll do it. Uh, the logistics of being isolated, you know, all the the money, et cetera, that'll get figured out. But the safety of it, what's the resistance going to be like, do you think? Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if resistance is the right word yet. It, mm-hmm. It's more that they need to see a coherent plan laid out. Now, baseball did that for its players. Um, there's been a back and forth, but they've laid out kind of the plan for how they want their season to go. And the NBA is getting there. And they're starting to, you're seeing in the last couple of days, they've uh, started to enlist the help of some of these diagnostic labs to yeah. to work with. And and that, these are all steps that need to be taken then presented to players um, for, for them to kind of approve. But one thing that is worth, that, that's significant here is that there really is a, a strong relationship between Adam Silver and, and both Chris Paul, the head of the Players Union for the players, and Michelle Roberts, the director. So th- they've been in, in, you know, I hate the phrase, but constant communication. But they have, like, daily talking uh, about these things. So they're, you know, they're keeping the players in the loop. And at some point in the next day or two, I would, I would expect us to get uh, the NBA coming out with some kind of clear plan for how they're going to conduct this process. Yeah, Chris, what's the urgency? You know, I think from a fan standpoint, we're like, man, they got to hurry up and get this thing. You know, in before it gets too late, and they don't have enough time to finish the season. Um, but they can always push back the next season. But is there an urgency to get this thing resolved and the the league or the season started up again? Not really, because there really isn't any kind of urgency to start next season. And you know, I think regardless of how this year plays out, you're not going to see the 2020 2021 season begin until Christmas or maybe even after if the NBA believes that it's more viable to get fans in stands by starting uh, in January. That's the name of the game for them in terms of their uh, their revenue. Forty percent of that revenue for Adam Silver comes from, uh, you know, comes from that gate revenue. So uh, no matter what, I think the NBA is going to push it back. And if, if that's the case, there really isn't any kind of timeline that you need to stick to. All, all that being said, it started to trickle down to teams. And I talked to one just this morning that you know, there's a pretty, there's a tentative slate being laid out where you have, you know, players trickling back in beginning June 1st. They're back in facilities June 15th. Uh, end of June, you start kind of an informal training camp. And then by mid-July, you are wherever you're going to be, be that Las Vegas, Orlando, or potentially both, which is st- still something on the table. Is it regular season completion? Is it just pick it up where the seeds are? What, what's the plan with that, Chris? There's still a goal for regular season completion, and you it's less about you know giving the Pelicans a chance to compete for a playoff spot or allow teams that are jockeying for position in conferences to, to settle into slots. It's all about money, and mm-hmm. it's all about the revenue that has to go you get from those local affiliates. Uh, there's a certain number that these affiliates have to hit. It's right around 70 games for things to level off for next season. The message I've been getting from – league officials that if you don't hit that number next season is just a mess financially you've got to do make goods with these uh, affiliates you've got to deal with what you have to owe uh, national television outlets as well they really want to get to the minimum number of games they've got to get to uh, to satisfy these obligations that's interesting to know so that's chris maddox senior nba writer si you know chris it's funny because you, you think about it in terms of the motivation to get back this year, and, and I, know T, I know Tiki just asked you about that, but I want to challenge you in a, in a way that I see it. I can't prove this, but I can only think that common sense on some level this has to apply. Let's say Daryl Morey never hit enter on that tweet, and that tweet <laughs> never went out, <laughs> and the NBA never lost whatever God knows the NBA's lost as a result of him hitting enter, right? Because he did hit enter, to me, there, there's got to be, and again, I can't prove it, but there's got to be extra motivation to get back and squeeze out every ounce of the season because of how much they lost with China. It's been their worst season economically maybe of all time. Yeah, I mean, look, that, that's certainly a factor, but the money lost via China, which you ballpark it right around $300 million, if you believe the league, um, 
is just a pittance compared to what you lose based on everything else. I mean, this is you're talking into the billions lost if you scrub this season and you have to go into next season without fans. I mean, it really is. I, I don't want to minimize the amount of money China brings in, but it, it's not significant compared to you know what they'd lose domestically because of that. So it. Yeah, you know, maybe for, for certain owners, it's like, well, we already lost this, so we have to get back that. Mm-hmm. But you'd be surprised how many owners, you know, really aren't all that enthused about restarting the season. I mean, mm-hmm. it comes down to, to, you know, they have to figure out a way to, to deal with the salaries of players. But if owners have to pay, you know, players a certain amount of money and they could get away with minimizing their losses, they'd probably scrub it because there's still a lot of unknowns about coming back to play. I mean, all we've had at this point, guys, is UFC coming back. And even yeah. that had some problems in its first weeks back. So uh, I think there are still some concerns that they come back, there's some kind of outbreak, and it, it just gets bad for everybody involved. That's interesting. Yeah. So you're saying that the owners, and NASCAR is back, but this is a non-contact type sport. Right. But I hear, I hear what you're saying. So it, it's almost as if the owners understand that they're going to lose some money, but they might share some of that losses with the players. Doesn't that have to be – negotiated won't Michelle Roberts and the PA and Chris and Chris Paul won't they have to agree to not continuing the season well the the short answer is yes but it's it's a little more complicated because it's not that big a deal for this year I mean Mm -hmm. most of the players if not all have gotten 50 60 75 percent of their salaries already like it's stuff's already been paid out so you can I don't think a negotiation on that point would be exceedingly difficult. I mean, there is a force majeure clause that we know by now in the CBA that allows owners to effectively do what they want uh, during a pandemic when games are, are being canceled. So that's, uh, I, I think that's settled. What's the bigger issue is next year. And this is why you've heard the NBA and the commissioner be very transparent, both on you know public statements and in calls that have been leaked about how much money they're losing. Because they need these players to know that it's not a drop in the bucket. Having fans not present is going to cost them a fortune. And they and Adam Silver knows that there are a lot of owners that are going to be hardliners on this because owners are not only losing out on the revenue from NBA games. Many of these owners own the buildings. Yep. So these buildings are concerts. sitting vacant. So you're not having concerts or yeah. uh, conventions or oh, whatever yeah. might yeah. be in. And that's I mean that is tens of millions of dollars in revenue that is lost over an annual over a year. So I feel like there's a lot of ground softening being done by Adam Silver, not for what could happen for the rest of this season, but negotiations for next year where they could get contentious just like they are right now in baseball. So we're talking to Chris Maddox, and Chris is a senior NBA writer SI. Chris, I want to throw this by you. I want to take you to the documentary, The Last Dance, and specifically, you know, how Pippen feels. And certainly respect his, I mean, it's his, it's his feelings. Of course, he's entitled to feel that way. But I, I, I presented it this way earlier with Tiki. To me, there were four main components to Pippen, and I want to see where you sit. Uh, throughout the 10 parts the contract the surgery quitting on the bulls and the heroic performance against utah in game six the contract i believe the the public residue was favorable he almost became a sympathetic figure the surgery all right that made him look a little bad Hmm. quitting on the bulls you know we rehashed that a million times but he made it worse by saying he'd do it again and then the heroic performance it elevated him to a superhero status like does he have the right and i'll put quotes around the word right to be livid at the way he was portrayed? Because I don't really see it that way. I think he made it worse on himself. Yeah, I don't think so either. I, I didn't I didn't walk away from that documentary thinking, boy, that was rough on Scottie Pippen. I mean, they did rehash stuff we already knew, and the most damning evidence was him saying, I'd do the exact same thing again that 94 uh, playoffs where I'd sit out uh, in that moment when Kukoc made the shot. So, I mean, the, the stuff about – we knew about the, the sitting out stuff. We knew about, um, you know, getting his surgery done early in the season, which, you know, it gets a lot lighter now that after Shaq did it, so the whole company yeah. timeline, which yep. has become the, the motto there. But I, I didn't walk away thinking Pippen looked all that bad. I mean, if you're Thelma Krause, the widow of Jerry Krause, yeah. you think that whole documentary is a piece of crap. Agreed. Like that, that was brutal on Jerry Krause. And I wrote that earlier in the week. I mean, Jerry Krause – was a Hall of Fame executive. Uh-huh. The Bulls dynasty does not happen without Jerry Krause. Jerry Krause pissed off Phil Jackson at the end, but he's the only guy that plucked Phil Jackson out of Albany when nobody else was going to do it. I mean, Phil Jackson might have gone to law school if Jerry Krause uh-huh. didn't come along and, and take him and put him on the bench of Doug Collins. He drafted Scottie Pippen. He drafted Horace Grant. Go down the list. I, I thought Jerry Krause, it, it was 
downright cruel what they did to Jerry Krause without putting in context outside of a throwaway line by Pippen at the end uh, about what kind of executive he was. Yeah, no, Great I point. agree with you. That was, that was, that yep. was my takeaway. BT and I talked about this on Monday. My mm-hmm. biggest takeaway was Jerry Krause comes off looking so bad, and it's, and it's so unfair. You know, interesting, though, Chris, I, I'm interested in your perceptions on Jordan. Like, how do you how do you now review Michael Jordan after this documentary? Obviously, he didn't shy away from some of the negative in his life. But uh, I said to BT on Monday, is he happy? You know, like, what, what do you think about Jordan after this 10 part series? No, I, I think he's ecstatic. I mean, look, he, he had the right. And I believe the director said this to kind of review everything before it went out. So he knew, knew what was coming. Uh, every time out, and look, he knows he can't ignore the stuff about his father, the gambling, but everything was framed in a positive light for Jordan. There was very little pushback on on any of the things that there could have been pushback on. I mean, Isaiah Thomas, you know, not making the 92 Olympic team, I mean, there was plenty written, you know, quoting Jordan firsthand at the time. My colleague Jack McCallum literally wrote the book on it and had Jordan quoted saying some things about Isaiah. There was no pushback when Jordan said it wasn't me on that. I mean, you guys have probably talked about it, but the whole poison pizza is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. I mean, it's just like the the idea that somebody would call a pizza shop and say it was for Michael Jordan is ridiculous. And the idea that, no offense to pizza makers of the world, that these guys are chemists, that they know <laughs> how to, like, you know, poison a pizza just enough uh-huh. that Michael Jordan will be sick for 24 hours. Well, I mean, what do you th- Chris, what do you think it was? I think yeah, I think he was sick off something, but I don't think it was the pizza. Whether it was the flu or you know something he drank two nights before, I don't I don't know. I mean, look, the, the, most, the most convincing evidence I have this is nonsense is that <laughs> Tim Grover, who plays a big part in all this, he had a book out recently, and he did a bunch of interviews with that book. Maybe you guys even talked to him. I mean, he talked to everybody. This never came up, and this is the most innocuous of stories. It's not like he's revealing that Michael Jordan was on craps table number five you know, in Las Vegas the night before. He's saying it was a pizza. Why is that not coming out until right now? It, it just doesn't, it doesn't pass the smell test for me. Uh, that's interesting. All right. Well, listen, Chris, we're, we're against it. Good having you back on. It's been a little bit. Uh, hopefully you're hanging in. It's uh, miserable across the board, but uh, hopefully you're staying safe, and it sounds like you are. So good to have you back on, Chris. Appreciate you. Anytime, guys. Thank you, man.